My name is Bill Miner. I'm a writer and a musician, and I came here in 1971 to teach English at Monterey Peninsula College. I had come down to Monterey when we lived in San Francisco in 1958-59 and camped in Big Sur, so I loved the place, and when I got the job I thought, I'm in paradise. Um, and I think they would have to drag me kicking and screaming from Pacific Grove where I live now. 1997, I had a very fortunate experience. I got a phone call one morning. I had written some articles about local musicians, and my wife and I, in the summer of 1990, went to the former Soviet Union and traveled 9,000 kilometers. And I wrote a book about what we found there, interviewing musicians, called Unzip Souls, A Jazz Journey to the Soviet Union. And on the basis of that work, the phone call was from Jim Costello, who was on the board of directors of the Monterey Jazz Festival. And he said, we are going to do a coffee table special honoring the 40 years of the Monterey Jazz Festival, and we'd like you to do the text. And so I was thrilled. And off we went. Tim Jackson, the general manager, and I sat down, and we drew up a list of people who were still alive. And in a way, that was sad, because Woody Herman, Carmen McRae, Sarah Vaughan, Duke Ellington, even Dizzy Gillespie, who was there more than any other person, were no longer with us. But the list we drew up was substantial. So it was a thrill for me because the people that I interviewed, I had seven months. I did 65 interviews, transcribed them myself, and they were all the heroes of my youth. Dave Brubeck, Percy Heath, John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet, Max Roach, the drummer. So that was, that was a thrill. And a photographer collected uh, about 150 photographs, priceless photographs. There's one of Billie Holiday in a gold May dress with a fur on because the first 1958 Monterey Jazz Festival was in October and it was cold. You know. And I was supposed to uh, get in touch with Clint Eastwood and do the forward and have him dictate the forward to me, but he was never in town. Uh, he was always off making movies. I came home one day and there was a phone message. Hello, Bill. This is Clint Eastwood. I came down to the festival office today, and you weren't there. I'll find you. I'll find you. <laughs> um, and I thought, God, Dirty Harry's going to track me down <laughs> to the end of the world. Um, and I made a recording of it and saved it and play it for my grandchildren who love it. Two people are credited uh, with starting the Monterey Jazz Festival, although many people obviously had a hand in it. Um, Ralph Gleason, who was a syndicated columnist, the first syndicated columnist for jazz writing in the United States of America with the San Francisco Chronicle. And he was a behind the scenes kind of guy, an intellectual. He was also very much interested in social issues. And later on when they brought in Janis Joplin and Jefferson Airplane, it was largely Ralph who was responsible for that. The front person really was Jimmy Lyons, who was a DJ, a very popular DJ up in San Francisco with his Discapades radio program. And he got tired of life in the city and came down to Big Sur and ran a general store in 1953 and fell in love with the place. And so he and Gleason got the idea, let's take jazz out of smoke-filled clubs and put it in a sylvan, what he called a sylvan setting. You know, it was not a totally original idea because the Newport Jazz Festival had started in 1954. And well, when I did a book on um, jazz in the Soviet Union, people in Tallinn, Estonia would say, you know, we had a jazz festival, an international jazz festival in 1948, so we were really the first. They went around and they contacted 67 business people in town, and each of them donated $100, and that was the budget they had for the first festival. They had incredible people, Billie Holiday, Jerry Mulligan, Dave Brubeck, the works. And so in 1958, on a cold October night, the festival started. A couple of stories about that first night. Louis Armstrong ended up on Sunday evening at the first jazz festival, and he was close to his 60s, and Dizzy Gillespie was about 42 years of age at that time. And Gillespie came out and introduced Armstrong, 
uh, and he got down on his knees and kissed Armstrong's hand, and Dizzy Gillespie had a way of clowning around, and everybody thought he was joking, but he was not. I mean, he revered Louis Armstrong, so there's a lot of homage being paid in that first festival. Something that's become classic is the airport is close by, so the planes come in to land, and they come in right over the fairgrounds, and Dave Brubeck was playing uh, For All We Know, and Paul Desmond was into his solo, and all of a sudden the plane came down in it, and Brubeck waited a few measures, and all of a sudden he went da 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 and of course the, the crowd cracked up and loved it. And that's become a tradition that, um, in this case, carried on to this, to, this, to this day. It was great. Financially, they lost a lot of money, and they decided they had to do something, get it under a little bit more control. They did something that was absolutely brilliant. They hired John Lewis of the Modern Jazz Quartet, and as Gleason said, he was the first person, who, an actual musician, who had been in charge of programming and implementing an institution like that, and it worked beautifully. And he started right off having amazing things. They drew up a list of principles they hoped to follow for the rest of the festival, and in some ways they've kept fairly close to it. They wanted to avoid what was hackneyed or trite. They wanted to expose people to the most recent events and things that are happening in the jazz world. They didn't want to just have a series of name acts, but they wanted to take people and break them up and have them play the people who had never played before, which was incredible. And they wanted to maintain a festive. They wanted it to really be fun, which I think it still is to this day. And a good example, Jimmy Witherspoon was uh, retired. He just looked, people had lost sight of him, this brilliant blues singer. And he was back in Covington, Kentucky, and Lyons got a hold of him and said, you've got to come out and play the Monterey Jazz Festival. So they set him up with Earl Father Hines, Ben Webster on saxophone, and, or, and um, Colvin Hawkins. So this incredible aggregate. And I have a recording of that, and one of my favorite blues stanzas is in there. If fish can love in water, moles love underground. <laughs> if fish can love in water, moles love underground. If rats can love in a garbage can, woman, you better not let me down. <laughs> And apparently, uh, Witherspoon didn't have any money and didn't have a car, and Lyons sent him, got him both, gave him the money to buy the car, and he drove out, and it was a great success. I'll just another quick anecdote was fun. Sarah Vaughn had the nickname Sassy for good reason. She was there frequently, and one year she came and sang, and they had bought a whole bunch of new Oldsmobiles to bring people to the fairgrounds. And she was staying at a hotel only four or five blocks away, and I guess they went over in one of the Oldsmobiles, and she came out and looked at it and said, we do not ride in Oldsmobiles. And Dave Murray, who was production coordinator, said they had to look all over town to find a limo that could escort Sassy four blocks or five blocks to the Monterey Fairgrounds. So there's stories like that. In 1962, Dave Brubeck and his wife Eola wrote the libretto and they did a piece called The Real Ambassadors. And the premise of it was that if jazz musicians were the ambassadors in the world, the world would be a far better place. And people like Dizzy Gillespie, Brubeck, had gone around the world for the State Department. You know, and, and Louis Armstrong was in it and Carmen McRae. It's absolutely wonderful. Lines like, if our neighbors call us vermin, we send out Woody Herman. <laughs> Actually, it was far ahead of its time, and they had aspirations for Broadway, and unfortunately it was controversial because it dealt head-on with the issue of segregation. Just some very moving songs by Armstrong dealing directly with that. I'll do two others quickly more recent. 2004, Miriam the Partland is one of my favorite pianists, and she came and she had three of her favorite pianists, Lynn Ariel, Jason Moran. She played duets with these people. And then they each played with their own groups, and it was an amazing display of piano virtuosity. Kurt Elling, 2006, was the artist in residence. One of the things that Tim Jackson had done, he restored many of the features that started out with the Monterey Jazz, like having conversations with artists and also having a commissioned piece. So the commissioned piece that year was Dave Brubeck's Cannery Rose Suite, and Roberta Gambarini was in it, and Kurt Elling. And Kurt Elling did just about everything that year. He played with the Yellow Jackets. He played down at a little club called Monterey Live, which was great because it was a small venue in town. And he's just an amazing person. So I think just the year of Kurt Elling was one of my favorite events also. It got a little bit stale because the same people kept getting invited back year after year after year. And the problem with that was the one that we found out is some of them were simply no longer alive. That was true of Sarah one year. She was booked, and she... She didn't make it. You know. So in 1992, Tim Jackson took over as general manager of the Monterey Jazz Festival. And people were a little bit worried, the old guard, because they thought he's going to be, he's so young, he's going to be so radical, 
he's going to stand the event on its head. But right away he said, I am not a revolutionary, I'm an evolutionist. And he stuck to that, and I think he's done a brilliant job of a blend of the traditional and what's most recent. And I think every year that keeps coming up. I think he's a genius when it comes to programming. This year, there, there's so many events going on in so many venues. At one time, it was only in the main arena. Now there's the garden stage, there's Dizzy's Den, there's the nightclub, there's a coffee gallery where they have mostly piano trios. You know. And I found that um, I mostly have to program myself in terms of what I'm going to go see. So this year, I focused, and you can do this, I focused strictly on female pianists because I'm a pianist myself. And the woman from Japan, Hiromi, started off, and she is just extraordinary, just high energy, charged. And then you can move from that over, went over to the coffee gallery and heard a wonderful pianist from Houston, Texas, um, Helen Sung, who was brilliant. And I'm an ex-Detroiter, and Jerry Allen has always been a favorite of mine. And she did a thing on the main stage in which she used a tap dancer, a Maurice Chestnut, I believe is his name, a young man who was just the most incredibly coordinated human being I've ever seen. And first I thought, I don't want to hear a tap dancer with a trio. You know? And he turned out to be an integral part. She has, she's brilliant. She wove him in as if he were almost like a saxophone player or a fourth member of the aggregate itself. You know? So I think the festival's in great hands. Um, it's in its, that was its 54th year. It advertises itself as the longest continuous running festival in the world, which it is. You know? There is a new general manager, Chris Doss. Tim is artistic director. And a, the education program is phenomenal. It's a model for schools all over the United States of America. And Rob Clevin did a beautiful job of putting that together. And now it's going to be Paul Cantos, who's one of my favorite saxophonists in the area. And he's going to be director of the education program.